Yo, 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 welcome back, welcome back. It is me, Dr. Shengima Vima, as always, and I'm back with another video today. Today we're talking about the East Coast of Africa up until the 16th century. Okay, so if you're game and I'm game, let's play. All right, so the idea here is this is one of the videos in our Intro to African History series. And um, so it is the equivalent of maybe if you are taking a first year college class and you've never dealt with this material before, um, or if you're just a casual historian, if you will. And I'll put all my sources in the description if you wanna go deep, deeper with it. Now, this is not to say that's all we do on this channel. Every now and then we'll do, we have other series which are more in depth, right? That are more specific, specialized topics. And soon I'll be bringing in guests as well to, to speak on their areas of, of expertise. But in any case, that's what we're talking about today and the Eastern coast of Africa. So, or oh, in case you're wondering about that song I was playing in the beginning, that is a song by Burner Boy featuring Saudi so it's called Time Flies and it's off of his new album Twice as Tall. And the reason that I was playing it is the first reason is just because I really like it and I thought I would put you guys onto something new, but also because since we're talking about East Africa, uh, Saudi Soul is a group from Kenya, in my opinion, the best group on the continent right now. So since they're featured on the song, I figured it would be a nice little segue into our conversation for today. But without further ado, let's get right into the material. All right, we are cooking with gas. I'll see you guys at the end. So when you talk about the East African coast, for the most part, we are talking about historically, this region that is painted in green here. Um, and that region is also known historically as Azania, known to the Greeks and the Romans as, as Azania, or also known in later as, as the Swahili coast. And we'll talk about why that is in a little bit. But why should we devote so much time in talking specifically about that region that is a sliver of the continent in this green area here. And if you know the countries, this sort of spreads, this sort of spans Kenya, Tanzania, a little bit into Mozambique to the south. And by some estimations, it goes further north into, into Somalia as well. So that's the reason we're talking about. Well, so it's historic and historic, political, cultural, and economic inf and and cultural, economic, and political influences are why we are even talking about it today. So let's get right into, into why this matters at all. The East Coast of Africa was very well known across the world. It was known in, in, in Arabia and Asia, of course, but it was also very well known to the, to the Greeks and Romans, who were some of the global powers at the time of uh, the beginning of the AD era, so in the first century AD, right? So you see that authors and, and travelers wrote a lot about, about this place, about, about, about Azania, what they called Azania in, in, in the Greco Roman books, which translates to, there's some debate on what it translates to, but one of the more accepted terms is translated to, into the land of dark faces, the land of dark faces. And it is described thus in, in, in one of the many places that is described, um, two runs beyond this island comes the very last port of trade of the coast of Azania called Rapta, a name derived from, the, from sewn boats where there are great quantities of ivory and tortoise shells. And that's a quote taken from a famous travel book out of the Greco-Roman tradition known as the Periplus of, a, of the Eritrean Sea. Um, so a few words come out of this that I think are worth talking about. The first one is uh, Azania we already spoke about. The second one is this place called Rapta which many discuss as being the northern, oh no, sorry, the southern 
southernmost part of the Azanian eye of what they regarded as Azania. And while there are still some debates on where that exactly is, uh, many people posted it as being uh, towards the end of Tanzania. So if you're looking at this map, they posited it as being around, around this region here. Okay, so that's where, that's where, or a little bit to the south of Kilwa actually. Um, then the last, the last thing that we were talking about was, uh, was the idea of the name comes from this idea of these boats that were sewn together, which speaks to this particular quality about the, co about the society that they were very skilled fishermen. Shouldn't come as a surprise, right? Because a lot of people who, who historically live by the waters are skilled fishermen. So being people of the coast, they were very proficient uh, seafarers, but most importantly, very skilled fishermen. And for a long time, the, the, the society was vibrant in that first century, first millennia AD, but trade was still kind of slow, even though they were known in Southern Arabia and these places. <clears throat> and they would also often trade with Aksum, which, is, uh, which had risen to the top circa 5th century to 8th century AD. And Aksum is a kingdom that is, um, would have been located around here in modern day Ethiopia, right? So things are going okay. However, what really invigorated the Indian Ocean trade and thus that coast was the spread of Islam, which begins in the seventh century AD. And what happens in the seventh century AD? Well, that's when the religion itself starts, right? With uh, Muhammad and his, and his followers fleeing Mecca towards Medina in 622 and, and so forth. So that's when you start to get many people actually migrating, for example, you hear in that seventh century, refugees uh, instructed, you know, who, refugees who were his followers are instructed by the prophet Muhammad to find refuge among the Christian king of Aksum. And eventually, so that's in the seventh century, that's the first group that settles there. Then eventually more and more people, uh, more and more Muslim people migrate there right so you get several different groups that end up relocating to relocating to africa and to to east to the eastern side of africa and more and more of them move further down south so for example other groups include this in addition to the muslim migrants who sought political and religious asylum in ethiopia as I've mentioned, the, 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 the followers of Muhammad. There were, there were dissident Muslims as well, including Shias, Ibadis, Karijites from Southern Arabia and Persia who sought refuge and new opportunities in East Africa. So that's a succession of people coming in over the years, right? Um, and they would settle among the indigenous Azanians. And oh, and this is a big four power on my part. Who lives there already before we start talking about who's migrating over there? The original people are people of Bantu stock, right? There are Bantu people who are referred to as Azanians, uh, but they're, they're different groups of, 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 of Bantu people. If you know the four major language families in Africa, uh, one of them is the Niger Congo, and part of the Niger Congo B subset is the Bantu languages, out of which a lot of uh, Sub Saharan Africans. Um, occupy, including the, the you know different groups from the Zulus to the Shonas to the Chewas. So that's that's the community out of which the Bantu people come. So that's who is there already. But the Shiite refugees and the other groups I just spoke about settle there and begin to intermarry, and such that by the ninth century, by the ninth century A.D., many many uh, there's developed a succession are very important eastern coastal cities that are that established market towns including Zanzibar over here Kilwa Mombasa to the north of Zanzibar the Comoro Islands which are around here but are not pictured in the in the map for some reason uh, in in this particular map so several prominent towns developed by the 9th century so that's in the 8 800s right 
and this would only go on that this would only be this will only increase as we go further so here's a report from a from al masudi who was a 10th century scholar and and and, and traveler who who wrote about his experience in in azania which by the way the 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 arab settlers or the the the, the arab settlers who were settling in as part of this uh, Muslim refugees and other people who came later, immigrants, called this place the Zanj, Z-A-N-J. That's how they refer to Azania, the Zanj or, or, or Zenj, Z-E-N-J. So when you see those terms, that's what they're talking about. And this is how he describes it. And I quote, this is in 916 AD. The land of Zanj produces wild leopard skins. The people wear them as clothes or export them to Muslim countries. They are the largest leopard skins and the most beautiful for making saddles. They also export tortoise shells for making combs, for which ivory is likewise used. The Zanj are settled in that area, which stretches as far as Sofala, which is the furthest limit of the land and the end of the voyages made from the Oman and Seraph of, on the Sea of Zanj. The Zanj use the ox as a beast of burden, for they have no horses, mules, or camels in their land. There are many wild elephants in this land, but no tame ones. The Zanj do not use them for war or anything else, but only hunt and kill them for ivory. It is from this country that come tusks weighing 50 pounds and more. They usually go to Oman, and from there are sent to China and India. This is the chief cloud route. The Zanj have an elegant language and men who preach in it. One of their holy men will often gather a crowd and exhort his hearers to please God in their lives and to be obedient to him. He explains the punishments that follow up upon disobedience and reminds them of the ancestors and kings of old. These people have no religious law. Their kings ruled by custom and by political expediency. End quote. And now that is very fascinating because of this next step that I'm going to explain about what happened when the, when when uh, when these Muslim settlers settled among among the folks among the Azani, what they call the Azans or Azanians, which are the local Bantu communities who lived along the, the coast here. So as the demand for ivory as far out as China, as, as, as Al Masudi explained, and later gold increased, more and more Muslim merchants carrying a large range of products and Islamic practices made their way into Sub-Saharan Africa, right? This is the, you know, the area that they said on. Traveling by either camel caravan across the Sahara or by boat from the Arabian Peninsula to the east coast of Africa, by the 10th century, the era out of which Al Masudi is writing, there were prominent market states, you know, which we spoke about. Ivory, in particular, was in high demand because the African elephant, the tusks, the African elephant is bigger than the Indian elephant, and thus its tusks are bigger as well. But they are also softer, which makes it easier for 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 people who for uh, craftsmen to make things with it. Right. And what happens here is is a mixing of cultures, right? What people have described as the Islamicization of Africa and the Africanization of Islam. The two cultures are uh, they blend well. It's not just one culture was the uh, um, was just up, was uh, put upon another, imposed upon another or that uh, the other culture, the external culture was internally just uh, rubbish when people got there. But there's such a mix and nothing represents this more than the creation of the language we call Swahili today, which is uh, a Bantu language. It falls into the Bantu language family, but however, it is highly creolized. And let me see if I can find here uh, from my readings here, how they describe it. Indeed, this is from a book by Omar H. Ali, and I'll put the link to, to it in the, in the description as a way he describes. These Swahili traders of increasingly mixed African and Arab descent developed a new language, Kiswahili, combining the linguistic structure of Bantu 
with a number of Arabic loan words, especially those associated with Muslim religious practices and to a lesser extent Persian. The written form of Kiswahili used Arabic script. So you get this sort of mixing of cultures that results in the formation of this creolized language that is Swahili. Um, and even as the Islam became the dominant religion of the area between the 10th and 14th century AD, there were differences in practicalities of daily worship between the Swahili Muslims and Muslims everywhere else. For example, for many Muslim converts, the practice of appeasing spirits who brought illness and other misfortunes continued, as well as, as, well as did the worship of ancestors. And in some places, women enjoyed better rights than they did under Sharia law. Okay, so there's this mixing of communities that results in a place that is distinctly Islamic in religion and culture, but African, African in language and personnel. And that culture, that's a quote from, the Shillington, from a book by Kevin Shillington. But I would still argue that the culture is a, is a hybrid of both, right? That is the way in which the Swahili towns, Swahili trading towns grow and establish this very distinct culture as well. And there is a great quote as well by Marco Polo, the traveler, the uh, European traveler, when he got there, when he got to Azania, and he he says this about uh, Zanzibar. And he's talking about, indeed, the ships of Malabar, which is India, which visited the island of Madagascar, and that the other of Zanzibar, which is Zanzibar, arrived there with marvelous speed. For great as the distance is, they accomplished it in, in 20 days, while the return voyages takes them more than three months. Zanzibar is a great and noble island. The people are all idolaters and have a king and a language of their own. The people live on rice and flesh and milk and dates, and they make wine of dates and of rice and of good spices and sugar. There's a great deal of trade. So there's a lot to be said there by this report by Marco Polo. First of all, it's, it's typical of this sort of European exploration that, that leads to colonialism, right? Because he says here, and have a king in a language of their own. What do you think? You think people just exist without a language of their own? So it's such an absurd thing to add there, right? What, what were you expecting? Do you ever go to, com anyway, I don't want to dwell in on that too much, but that's a report about, about Zanzibar as well, which is also written Zanzibar because of, of that Zanj that, that, that we said uh, earlier. So that's a little bit about the growth of the Swahili trading towns. And since we are talking about, since we were talking about, about Swahili as a dominant language, today it is the most widely spoken African language with uh, indigenous African language, with more than 150 million speakers uh, across the continent, including prominently, of course, in Kenya, Tanzania, as well as uh, going into Rwanda, places like that. And as more and more people migrate, it's even a prominent language in South Africa, in Mozambique, um, overseas as well, right? It's popular in Oman, where a lot of the settlers of the Swahili coast the Muslim settlers had come from, and now in other hot spots of of of, um, of immigration, such as the USA and the UK, there's a sizable Swahili-speaking population as well. And if nothing else, you'll recognize it from as the language that is used in the Lion King. And just to show, you know, almost as an aside, just to show how critical the language has been getting. Uh, as uh, in, in, its, in, in modern times, it has been suggested for, uh, for, for use as a ubiquitous universal African language. The African Union has suggested this, and as, as this news headline from 2019 in South Africa suggests, is uh, Kiswahili could be an antidote, quote unquote, to xenophobia in South Africa, South Africa being a country that is often haunted 
by incidents of, of anti-African immigrant xenophobia. There's been this talks of if we can teach this language in schools and, 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 and you know, create, use it to create bridges between South Africa and the rest of the continent. And this is just to use South Africa as an example because uh, the story has been told oftentimes, but there are many other countries that don't necessarily have Swai native Swahili speakers across the continent that are now making sure that uh, Swahili is provided as an option for students. And my own native Zimbabwe is one of those countries. So, but back to, to talking about the, the Eastern coast of Africa up until the 16th century. So between the 10th and the 14th century, Kilwa, right? Kilwa, which is posited, uh, you know, as you can tell on the map here, becomes one of the prominent, the, the most important and wealthiest Swahili city, right? As, as the East Coast was growing in prominence as more and more people settled um, with many people, as more people migrated from the Persian Gulf and, 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 and such, they would land in maybe around Somalia, Mogadishu area, and more people were pushed further down, you know, on the East Coast, further to the South Italy. So this is how the cities grew. So initially Mogadishu, actually in Somalia was the main city on the East Coast prior to, in the first millennium AD, right? So it would be further up here if, you, if you're looking at this map. Um, but at that point, it, the, 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 the people of Mogadishu had control to a very important resource, which is the gold mines and gold uh, deposits in on the Zimbabwean plateau down here. Um, but as you can tell, that is pretty far up north from, from there, right? So the people dealing in gold figured, or communities interested in the gold felt that if they could establish a trading center on the coast, on the ocean, but far closer to the Zimbabwean plateau. So that's part of how Kilwa uh, developed and, and grew to be what it is, what it is known as. Uh, as, as as such an important place, and and just not even as an aside, but it is very important to know that the Zim Great Zimbabwe, the community we call the Great Zimbabwe, of uh, which which uh, existed from say twelve fifty onwards for the next two hundred to three hundred years, its time at the peak. Uh, of uh, at the peak of its success and 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 prominence coincides perfectly with that of Kilwa, and that is not coincidental, right? And I'm looking here at the book that titled uh, "Becoming Zimbabwe," where it says um, there is, for example, and I quote: "There is, for example, a special relationship between Great Zimbabwe and Kilwa, the former being the supplier of goods destined for the coast." and the latter being the port of entry for trade items. The collapse of Great Zimbabwe was linked in more ways than one to that of Kilwa, end quote. So, and you see this in, this is in a Zimbabwean history book. So you see this all over the place that Kilwa subsisted largely on being able to access resources from the Zimbabwean plateau and the Zimbabwean plateau subsisted largely on, on Kilwa being able to push its products, its, 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 its raw materials and so forth all the way out into as far out as the Arabian Peninsula and, and Asia. So what were the, these things that were traded? Um, in one direction, goods came from Arabia, Persia and India and through these places from China and Southeast Asia. Again, foreign products were both consumed in the Swahili city states and traded on to African settlements. Uh, the Swahili states themselves manufactured goods both for their own residents and for trade such as pottery, cloth, and highly decorated uh, pottery and other things like that. So, so this was the way in which Kilwa rose to prominence. 
And a lot of these countries had, a lot of these communities, these city-states, often got along. There was general camaraderie, trading competition for sure, trading rivalries, but because they had very similar cultures through which one, the sultans uh, or the, the, the Islamic leaders of the communities were understood the benefit of shying away from warfare since they were all Muslim communities and so forth. So they had trade rivalries, but they hardly ever fought. Um, and also there was uh, a good dynamic between the, 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 the immigrant, the, the Arabic immigrants and the local communities typically, right? If anybody was attacked, there was regular jihad, what they called reg regular jihad, on the, what they call the Pagan Zans, uh, you know, that is to say parts of the, probably more on the interior, uh, what they call the, you know, the Zans, right? But Pagan, which means infidels. But they were really attacked, not so much for the, the difference in belief, but to be, to be raided and so forth. And since the, 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 the Swahili coast cities preferred not to raid each other, they would rather uh, raid these other, these other people. But yeah, so that would happen every now and then. So, indeed. So that is a little bit about Kilwa up until the 14th century at which it was at its peak. So why does it decline? You know, and it holds on up until the 15th, even 16th century, but 10th to 1500s is when it was at its peak. 10th uh, from uh, 1000 to 1500. So, you know, it, you know, a long time, right? 11th to 16th, uh, to the beginning of the 16th century. Then it starts to decline after that. And what does it coincide with? What does, what does its decline coincide with? Well, we are about to find out, right? Um, the arrival of the Portuguese. Now, even by European colonial standards, the, pro, uh, the Portuguese arriving in East Africa is a thing of renown in, in its violence and its, and its destruction. So, the Portuguese were the first Western Europeans to enter the Indian Ocean from the south, right? This really marked the beginning of the end for the glory days of the, of the Swahili coast. Um, and they, 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 a lot of Europeans had been to the east of Africa by way of, of the South Arabian Peninsula and so forth. The Portuguese are the first to come down all the way down the west coast of Africa, right? Past uh, Senegambia, past Angola, all the way down to modern day South Africa, then up by way of uh, past Mozambique and onto, onto Azania. They were the first ones to do that under the leadership of, of, of Vasco da Gama. And this was as part of their trip, trying to figure out how to get to India. And immediately the things that they saw blew them away. The things that, that Vasco da Gama and his peers saw blew them away. And I'll read a little bit about, about how they describe some of them here. For example, um, it says here, and I quote from the book itself, Vasco da Gama and his crews were astonished and relieved at Kilimane in southern Mozambique to find that they had swum once more into a zone of trade and frequent ocean voyaging. They had news of ships still bigger than theirs and pressed upon the coast. At Malindi in modern Kenya, they borrowed a pilot who was familiar with the route to India. So this, all the, you know, they, this place is far more knowledgeable and advanced than they'd imagined. Other Portuguese followed where Da Gama had led. Kilwa, they found, was a town with many fair houses of stone and mortar, very well arranged in streets with doors of wood, well carved with excellent joinery. So, and Mombasa was described as being a very fair place with lofty stone and mortar houses, well aligned in the streets after the fashion of Kilwa. So 
you can tell that they really not only did they the 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 the, the, the portuguese came upon this very vibrant trade international trade center which which had beautiful which was well civilized for people who were the europeans were going on a civilizing mission only to find that several of these places actually out were more civilized than much of what portugal may have been like at the time so so how do you how do you swing this well they had to take control right so they they posited this as as a a religious war right they posited this as a religious war and described what would happen next as wars against the moors now that's a very deliberate choice of words and i will explain why shortly um the idea here was if you remember up until the 19 up until the 15th century late into the 15th century um the moors had ruled over for 700 years had ruled over the iberian peninsula 700 to to 1400 uh late 1400s right with their rule waning at the end so the term more the term more soon grew to mean any dark skin any muslim across the board but especially uh the dark skinned muslims right which was different from the muslim berbers who had colonized but why would they use that language in this case when the way they would uh use the language this language to as 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 they went into war because the portuguese people and the christian world would be very familiar with being under the thumb of the moors so if they use the language of we are, we are fighting moors it was a bit of propaganda for them even though this is a totally different group unrelated except by religion to the moors of northern of north africa who had ruled over the iberian peninsula if you call these holy wars quote unquote uh against the moors it's easier to get the public support for them right so they posited them as that and started to to pressure these countries for so for example listen to this one of the things that they 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 sought to do was the tactic that they adopted was to sail through with heavily armed ships into the harbors of the more important towns kilwa mombasa and the likes then they demanded that the ruler of the town become a portuguese subject and pay a heavy annual tribute to the king of portugal and if these demands were not met the town was attacked all its possessions were seized and any muslims who were who resisted were killed and again this was justified as part of the holy war against the moors and when we talk about how violent these attacks were for hundreds for for the next 100 years it was insane and let me see if i can find a few quotes that talk about some of this violence here from my from my material here Here's, uh, here are some of the Portuguese eyewitness accounts that describe the sacking of Kilwa and Mombasa. From our ships, the fine houses, terraces, and minarets with the palms and trees in the orchards made the city, Kilwa, right, look so beautiful that our men were eager to land and overcome the pride of this barbarian who spent all that night in bringing into the island archers from the mainland. After some hand-to-hand -hand fighting, the following day the Sultan fled, and the Portuguese took the town. The um, they went to the place, and there the cross was put down, and the Grand Captain, whose name was Dalmeida, prayed. Then everyone started to plunder the town of all, of all its merchandise and provisions. After two weeks spent securing the town, 
building a fortress and appointing a new puppet sultan, the Portuguese fleet sailed up the coast to Mombasa. The Moors of Mombasa had built a strong point with many guns at the entrance of the harbor, which is very narrow. When we entered, the first ship was fired on by the Moors from both sides. We promptly replied the fire and with, and with such intensity that the gunpowder in the strong point caught fire. It started burning and the, Moor, the Moors fled, thus allowing the whole fleet to enter and lie at anchor in the front of the town. The Grand Captain, Dalmeida, met with the other captains and decided to burn the town and that evening and to enter it the following morning. But when they went to burn the town, they were received by the Moors with a shower of arrows and stones. The town has more than 600 houses, which are thatched with palm leaves. In between the stone dwelling houses, there are wooden houses with porches and stables for cattle. Once the fire was started, it, it raged all night long. From this town, trade is carried on with Sofala and with Kambe. There were three ships from Kambe, and even these did not escape the fury of the attack. The archers and gunners went ahead of everyone else. Further on, they found three storied houses from which stones were thrown at them. But the stones which were thrown fell against the wall of the very narrow streets, so that much of the force of their fall was lost. There were also many balconies projecting over the streets under which one could shelter. The grand captains went straight to the royal palace where Captain Vermudes climbed up the wall and hoisted our flag, shouting, Portugal, Portugal. Only four Portuguese were killed in the attack on Mombasa, but the death of these four was avenged by that of 1,513 Moors, 1,513 Moors. The Grand Captain ordered that the town shall be sacked and that each man should carry off to his ship whatever he found, each man to receive 20th of what he found. Each one started to plunder the town. There was a large quantity of cl cotton cloth for Sofala in the town, for the whole coast gets its cotton cloth from here. So the Grand Captain got a good share of the trade of Sofala for himself. A large quantity of rich silk and gold embroidered clothes was seized and carpets also. One of these, which was without equal for beauty, was sent to the King of Portugal together with many other valuables. So, so that's one reading of how this violence occurred. And let me see if I can find, I've got a couple of different sources here that are talking about it. Um, so this is more of the same. Um, an, yeah, another writer in 1518, Duarte Barbosa, talked about how the great town, you know, of Brava, this is Brava, which is on the Somali coast, the great town of, of very fine stone and mortar houses was destroyed by the Portuguese, who slew many of its people and carried many into captivity and took great spoil of gold and silver and goods. Thenceforth, many of them fled away towards the inland country, forsaking the town. So this happened a lot. We spoke about Sofala, we spoke about uh, Kilo, we spoke about Mombasa, I spoke about Brava. So this was commonplace across the board. And in place of this very beautiful cities, once they had conquered these places by incessant violence, the total control of East Africa by 1600, by the East African coast by 1600. And they, uh, they erected several forts in Kilwa and Mozambique and Sofala. And this is one such fort here known as Fort Jesus in Kilwa. And it's, uh, uh, you know, it's just a monstrosity, right? <laughs> I mean, it's compared with the, with the, with the, with the grace with which these places were, this, this is very imposing and the, the, the juxtapose, juxtaposition of its name to what it is, 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 is pretty stark, but it's also very representative of what the Western European colonial system or colonial practices of Africa were, where they would pray, put a cross down before uh, killing 1500 men in response to the death of four 
uh, in a in a in a in a quote unquote war. And as I look at this, I remember that I had forgotten to to mention something else that that came up earlier, ah, which is this this structure here in Kilwa, which is the Great Mosque of Kilwa. Today is uh, is a is a UNESCO heritage site, but it's it's uh, it's an incredible place. It was founded in the 13th century and extended much more in the 15th century before it was uh, also attacked at the um, as the as the as, as, as Portuguese onset. So that's another incredible site in Kilwa that is still standing today that uh, you can go see if you ever visit. So that's a little bit about that. And, but, but before I finish today, I wanna make sure that I touch on, this takes us right to the, by the 16th, by 1600, right? By the end of the 16th century, the Portuguese uh, in having arrived in 1498 under the, the leadership of uh, Vasco da Gama and, and other such Portuguese explorers, is a hundred years later, uh, everything that had been built for the past, say, 1500 years, uh, but definitely in the past 500 years, was laid to waste in this very brutal, very violent takeover. But what that did was, not only was it negative to the, to the African and, and, the, and the Swahili coast in itself, it, the brutality of it all was very hard to come back for even Portugal itself. It had destroyed so much of the things that had brought them to the coast, right? Um, that they, it took, it, took, it took a toll and they were, by as early as 1550, they were finding it very hard to, to supply the trade. Uh, their ships had gotten old, they had made no friends in the region. So even though they were in control of the place, it didn't take them long. By 1637, uh, the Dutch and other new settlers, other European settlers were already starting to wrestle control of the territory away from them, right? Uh, they were ousted by the commercially thriving Dutch and afterwards the English and then the French. By 1650 could do little, but cling to, a, the Portuguese could do little, but cling to a few strong points such as Mozambique Island and, and Mombasa, or just tiny places, right? So it's almost when, when conquest goes wrong, when you overdo it, that you destroy exactly what you came to get. And not only that, uh, another negative impact of this is prior to that, there had been versions of slavery in that society, right? But... Uh, Small, you know, we're talking to minor figures here, uh, people who were captured in battle. It wasn't race-based, and a lot of the people could work their way out of slavery, if you will, if you paid off a debt, and or if you married somebody, these sort of things. However, so the East East Coast had been spared this large-scale slavery that was synonymous with the with the West Coast of Africa. However, with this, this ended up opening up. A, an, a a huge East African slave trade uh, through which many of the people, many of the enslaved people who ended up working in Brazil in the 19th century were, 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 were picked up from the East Coast, from what was formerly the, the Azanian coast by in the tens of thousands. But we'll talk about that later. But I wanted to emphasize that to show that the end the Portuguese violence that had disrupted the, the, the progress of the Swahili coast was itself so detrimental that one could argue that up until now, the, 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 the East Coast has never recovered or gotten back to its full glories as it had in the past. Uh, but we'll talk more about that later, but I just wanna leave you with that for now. And what are our big takeaways for this week? So, sorry about that. Okay, so what part of Africa is historically referred to as Azania? 
Let me put this addendum. I don't think I spoke about this earlier. Today, activists in South Africa argue that South Africa is a very colonial name, and it is not only colonial, but it is also not even the name of a country. It's just a cardinal point and a reference to the continent, right? So when they talk about what the name of South Africa should be, a lot of them claim, claim for it to be Azania, including such movements as the, uh, you know, the Pan-African Congresses. A lot of people refer to it as the Pan-African African, Pan -African Congress of, of Azania, um, as well as other movements, including the Black Consciousness Movement. Um, you know, we we'll talk about Azania. As, 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 as the alternative name for South Africa. Now you'll notice for a fact that Azani in South Africa is not, is not the historical place known as, as Azania, right? Which I, as I said, is, is East Africa and is around Tanzania and Kenya. But, you know, it also means the land of the dark faces and a lot of that is, so a lot of claims to that name are born out of this Pan-African pride and, and black consciousness and, you know, wanting to claim that name. So a little bit to think about, a little bit to look into, and that's a more contemporary, that is a very recent phenomenon. By recent, I mean, probably starting around the 1950s going forward, the claim for, for South Africa to be renamed as Zania, you know. So you might hear a lot of people who associate the name of Zania with South Africa, which is different from its, um, from its historical use. And that is not the first time that you see this, by the way. We get that with, um, for example, ancient Ghana is a different place from where what ended up being, uh, where the state of Ghana is today and, and so forth, right? You, you know, there's a lot of these examples. Name any four East and co East coastal market towns. We went through a lot today, you know, I'm sure you can just name a few, Kilwa, Mombasa and so forth. What does the name Swahili refer to? What language group does it belong to? Where did many of the settlers on the East Coast, on the Swahili Coast, migrate from? Which European nation was the first to enter the Indian Ocean from the South? And what are they renowned for during this time? Just some things to think about uh, as we go forward. Thank you so much for joining me today. I hope you enjoyed that video. I will, like I said, I'll put all my sources in the description below and we will be back next week, uh, hopefully. You know, it, my semester's ongoing now, so my, my days are a little bit tight, but I'm very committed to you guys and I will continue to try put this content out there. If you enjoyed the video, make sure to subscribe to the channel like share it and so forth and make sure you if you are new to the station uh to the channel make sure you go back and watch the other videos and thank you and i will see you next time